would like to call up the second panel, Dr. Tyson. Dr. Tyson, we've already given you uh, a glowing introduction already, and uh, if you would, uh, please proceed. We're looking forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Hutchison, Senator Bozeman, thank you for your attention here. I, I want to just preface this by saying uh, I, I was born the same week that NASA was founded, and while that specific point is of little rel relevance to the words of my testimony, I would say it's of great relevance to the feeling with which I deliver these words, having the same lifespan. I want to start off with a quote from a famous aviator, French aviator, Antoine saint exupéry This quote may be known to some of you, but I think it bears repeating often. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So that's a point of view that will matter for what follows here. Right now, NASA's Mars science exploration budget is being decimated. We're not going back to the moon. Plans for astronauts to visit Mars or anywhere beyond low Earth orbit are delayed until the 2030s on funding not yet allocated, overseen by a Congress and a president to be named later. When I think of our golden era of space exploration, the late 1950s right on up through the early 1970s, over that time, very few weeks would go by before there would be an article in a newspaper in a magazine <clears throat> where a cover story would extol the city of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, even food of tomorrow. And in spite of this optimism, that was a decade that was perhaps almost turbulent in a century since the Civil War itself. We all felt threatened from the Cold War, total annihilation in fact, there was a hot war going on, losing 100 servicemen a week, the civil rights movement, assassinations, and the like. The landscape was poisoned that decade. Yet, one of the jewels in the American crown was our exploration of space. From what I can tell, the people who did the dreaming back then were the scientists, engineers, and technologists. And it's a community of people who are formally trained to discover. They are discoverers. And what inspired them? Ask them. Everyone to a person will tell you it was America's bold and visible investment in a space frontier. Now, I happen to know, and we all have had this experience, exploration of the unknown doesn't always make a priority for people. I can tell you, however, that audacious visions have the power to alter mind states, to change assumptions about what is possible. And when a nation allows itself to dream big, these dreams prevail in the citizens' ambitions. They energize the electorate. During the Apollo era, you didn't need government programs trying to convince people that doing science and engineering was good for the country. It was self-evident. And even those not formally trained in technical fields embraced what those fields meant to the collective national future. Remember, that was the climate that birthed the New York World's Fair, which was all about tomorrow and the iconic Unisphere, which donned three rings, evoking the three orbits of John Glenn in the Mercury 7 capsule. During that age of space exploration, any jobs that went overseas were the kind nobody really wanted anyway. Those that stayed in this country were the consequence of persistent streams of innovation that could not be outsourced because other nations couldn't yet figure out how to do what it was we were doing. In fact, most of the world's nations stood awestruck by our accomplishments. 
let's be honest, of course, over that period we went to the moon because we were at war. It's not a secret. To think otherwise, though, in fact, is delusional. And it leads some people to suppose we got to the moon by 1969. Of course, we're going to be in Mars by 1980. No, not if you went to the moon because you were at war. You then established that the Soviet Union is not also going to the moon. Everything ends. But that was with a cost. What is that cost? Well, yes, war can get you to go to the moon, get, even get you to go to Mars. But there's another driver that exists, another driver of great ambitions, and it's almost as potent as the need to protect your security. And that's the promise of wealth. Nobody wants to die, of course, but nobody wants to die poor. Fully funded missions to Mars and anywhere beyond low Earth orbit, commanded by astronauts who today would be in middle school, would reboot America's capacity to innovate as no other force in society can. What matters here, in fact, are not spin-offs, although there are plenty of spin-offs that are fun to read about. NASA, every couple of years, puts out a document. NASA spin-offs, I recommend everyone here review that document if you haven't seen them. But beyond the spin-offs, what matters are the cultural shifts in how the electorate views the role of science and technology in our daily lives. Because as the 70s drew to a close, we stopped advancing a space frontier. The Tomorrow articles faded. We spent the next several decades coasting on the innovations conceived by earlier dreamers. They knew that seemingly impossible things were possible. And others among them, those who saw what the previous generation had enabled, witnessed the Apollo voyages to the moon, even though they were not a participant. And this is the greatest adventure there ever was. Yet if all you do is coast, eventually you slow down while others catch up and pass you by. We've got symptoms in society today. We're going broke, we're mired in debt, we don't have as many scientists as we want or need, and jobs are going overseas. I assert that these are not isolated problems, that they're the collective consequence of the absence of ambition that consumes you when you stop having dreams. In the NASA portfolio, it's multidimensional. It taps the frontiers of biology, which we look for life on Mars, chemistry, physics, astrophysics, geology, Atmospherics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, these are the classic subjects that are the foundation of the STEM fields. Science, of course, science, technology, engineering, and math, and they are all represented in the NASA portfolio. Epic space adventures, adventures plant seeds of economic growth because doing what's never been done before is intellectually seductive, whether or not we deem it practical. And when you conduct those exercises, Innovation follows just as day follows night. And when you innovate, you lead the world, you keep your jobs, and concerns over tariffs and trade regulations evaporate. The call for this adventure would echo loudly across society and down the educational pipeline. At what cost? The spending portfolio of the United States currently allocates 50 times as much money to social programs and education than it does NASA. So the old argument, why are we spending money up there and not down here? We are spending money down here, to the credit of the lawmakers understanding where priorities need to land. Consider, however, that the half a penny budget that NASA receives, if you double it, twice that, as unthinkable that is to so many, I assert that we can transform the country from a sullen, dispirited nation, weary of economic struggle, to one where it has reclaimed its 20th century birthright to dream of tomorrow. And I ask you, how much would you pay to launch our economy? And from my scientific heart, I ask, how much would you pay for the universe? A slightly longer version of these notes have been submitted for the record, and thank you for your attention, Senator. Well, of course, um, you are not only preaching to the choir, you're preaching to the preachers. <laughs> uh, and uh, you have just done it so eloquently, uh, so incisively. And I couldn't help but uh, think, as you were speaking, 
to be reminded of the event that we just had down at the Cape on the occasion of the uh, 50th anniversary of John Glenn's historic uh, space flight. And uh, as Scott Carpenter, who is the only other living of the original seven astronauts, uh, made his speech. And you remember that Scott Carpenter was the fella in the antiquated blockhouse uh, that, as John was just about to lift off, said, Godspeed, John Glenn. And then Scott ended up being the second one to ride the Atlas rocket, uh, this time for a lot more than just uh, three orbits, which uh, John Glenn had done. But in Scott's speech at this ceremony, commemorating the 50th anniversary, he recalled a column that had been written in the New York Times uh, calling John Glenn the last great American hero. And, and that column had rekindled a lot of what you have just articulated, Dr. Tyson that this was a heady time. It was. We were in the great space race with the other superpower. Uh, so much was hanging on the success of this program. And then during that time that you talked about, the 1960s, not only did we launch Glenn uh, after the Soviets had beat us into space, but then we took over and we took care of business and uh, did it uh, against uh, an extraordinary backdrop. And we were. We were the envy of the world. Uh, and in this column, as Scott is talking about this, was John Glenn the last great American hero? He quickly then said, no, we're going to come to this point again because it's going to be the commander of that mission when it goes to Mars and lands and returns. And so our objective is how do we get from there to there? Uh, if I may react to that, uh, I think any nation at any time has the capacity to create a hero. It just has to have ambitions with goals set so that one among us then steps forward, accepts those risks. Some of those who go forward don't come back, and this is an understood risk and fact of the history of our species. But those who do, who succeed, they get remembered forever. And I would assert that I would claim that the conversation needs to be taken to a, sep a new place, because apparently the argument that science is important but the argument that exploration feeds the, 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 the energy of our DNA. I have not seen that be as successful as it should have been over these years when NASA comes back to, to the White House and to the Congress hat in hand looking for money. But what I have noticed is that NASA as an engine of innovation, not simply by the innovation that occurs within the agency, but by the culture of innovation that it spreads into the land. It is that culture that is responsible for economic growth. And so if people see NASA as a charity agency for the satisfaction of some engineers and scientists, they are not understanding the actual role that NASA has played in the growth of this nation, in the economic growth of this nation. So this half a penny on a dollar, I say take it to a penny, find that other half a penny somewhere, recognize that penny on a dollar, penny on a dollar as an investment with a return that will so outweigh that one penny that you put in that you'd be kicking yourself wondering why that investment wasn't made earlier. And I'm not talking only about spinoffs. And they're great spinoffs from power, you know, power tools without cords and you know, the, the perfecting, uh, perfecting LAS LASIK surgery, making it cheap and affordable and precise and 
the grooved pavements, the list is long. There's low-tech solutions and high-tech solutions. My concern is, without that as a driving force within our culture, all these, everything else we do are just band-aids. Oh, we need more scientists? Let's train some more teachers. That's a band-aid. Oh, we need more jobs on shores? Let's try to bring factories in and incentivize them. That's a band-aid. The moment the culture wants to innovate, and we recognize that, that penny on a dollar becomes an investment. And it's not simply an investment in our identity, which it is, in our character, in our pride. It's all of the above. But what I have found in my read of the history of cultures that if you can find an investment that returns economically, you take it. You do it. And the, 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 the pathway from the investment to the return dollar takes a little longer than an elevator ride to explain how you get that. Innovations take place. Patents are granted. Products are developed. The culture of innovation spills over. Everyone feels like tomorrow is something they want to invent and bring into the present. That's, that's the nation that many of us in this room grew up with, and that's the culture that so many who read about it want to resurrect going forward. And so without this, we just move back to the caves because that's where we're going to end up anyway as the rest of the world passes us by. You have very accurately articulated our character as a people. We as Americans have always had a frontier. Uh, we've always been pressing that frontier. And as a result, we have always been explorers and adventurers. We don't want to ever give that up, or else we deny our character as a people. Senator Bozeman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, again, I want to echo you. Uh, uh, you are very articulate, and, and I think even more important, very enthusiastic about uh, the subject, which is so very, very important. It's very easy to tell that, uh, that this certainly is a passion, and we really do appreciate that. We, we need a lot more of that. Uh, with regard to America's scientific and technological workforce, a substantial portion is foreign-born and American-educated. In previous interviews, you mentioned that America is beginning to lose our technological workforce conduit as the rest of the world is catching up and providing technology opportunities for this workforce to leave America. How can we in Congress encourage or create more or better opportunities to retain our edge? And, and I guess, uh, what are your recommendations for the committee? How can we specifically help you in that regard? Well, Sorry, uh, other than doubling NASA's budget. Uh, I think the, uh, a bit about the foreign-born nationals getting graduate degrees in the sciences and engineering here. That's been going on basically since the 1980s. There might have been a trickle of it in the 70s, but it happened in large measure in the 80s and 90s. It's still going on. The, in the early days, uh, we were simply the best opportunities. We had the best science, the best engineering, and their home countries did not. And so it was expected that when they came here, they would stay, and nearly all of them did. I don't have a problem with that. So much of our national character and identity was enriched because of how open our shores were, our shores were to the creativity of immigrants that come through you know, for the past century and a half. So, so that became a boon to our nation intellectually because we were getting the smartest people in the world. But what happens back in their home countries, they begin to develop. The countries recognize what we had recognized from, for so long, that investments in their infrastructure and in their own science and technology creates opportunity. My great fear was that we would now educate them and then they would go back to their home countries and we would lose the contributions they would have made had they stayed. That's, in fact, already happening. The third stage in this is they become the professors and the, the educator in class in their home countries, and then they never have to come here at all. By the way, that was the state back before the Manhattan Project. Most of the principal scientists of the Manhattan Project that were here in this country were foreign nationals, all educated in, in European countries. We did not quite have the physics infrastructure to sustain that kind of, back, that, that kind of uh, intellectual capital to actually engage the Manhattan Project. So we not only tapped foreign nationals, they were all foreign educated. Once we developed that infrastructure here and that intellectual foundation, we became the target for people to become educated from all around the world. I would say that when a nation 
not to sound like a broken record here, uh, but when a nation dreams big and has fully funded projects visible to everyone, where a, a, a frontier is getting advanced daily, innovations attract smart, clever people. This, the, the, the prospect of innovation attracts them. And dare I say, well, if you stand up in front of an eighth grade class and say, you know, who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design a plane that's a few percent more fuel efficient, that doesn't really work, as well as saying, who wants to be an aerospace engineer because we need a plane that will navigate the rarefied atmosphere of Mars. You're going to attract the very best of those students. And the solutions to that problem, in every case I've ever seen, have improved life back here on Earth. And so if you don't have the projects on the other side of the educational pipeline, why, does, why should anyone even do it? Why shouldn't anyone even stay? You can't just say, become a scientist because we need more scientists. You compel people to long for the open seas. And when you do that, and the open sea is in reach because the government has declared that that's the next frontier, everything falls into place. Everything. We've seen it happen already. It can happen again. This time without the tandem military budget that was required in the 1960s to conduct a Cold War and a hot war. Imagine what that return will be going forward. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you very much for your testimony. We are singing from the same hymn book. Um, I, in your talk about a lot of the value that NASA provides by inspiring and motivating children, which you have made that case very, very strongly, uh, in these tight fiscal times, how do you make that value better understood by the average American person? That's, that's the multi-billion dollar question. <laughs> uh, that's, it's, it's an important question. I mean, I, I, I'm trying. First of all, I can tell you, based on my life experience, and I'm sure if you reflect on it, on your life experience as well, you never actually have to train kids to think scientifically. They're always experimenting, always. They're turning over rocks. They're, they're poking at objects that the adults don't want them to poke at. And, and we spend a lot of our effort as adults squashing that creativity and that exploratory drive that every child has within them. So when I'm asked, what do we do to excite children, my first answer is first get out of their way because that will be a natural part of their curiosity as a child. And the real problem with the science of literacy and the embracing of what science and technology will bring is not, I don't believe, in that next generation. It is in the current generation of adults who far outnumber children, who vote, who run the country, I'm not going to turn around and say the country has problems because we're not training our children. I'm going to say the country has problems because not enough adults understand what these arguments are. And I'd like to believe that no one wants to go to the poorhouse. So the economic argument needs to be lifted above all others. It needs to be lifted above the DNA argument, the, 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 the urge to explore argument, that it's in our, even with due respect, Senator, the, 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 the legacy of Americans as explorers I just have not seen that work on the soup line when someone can't feed their home and they're working with a foreclosed, um, can't feed their, their, their family and they've got a foreclosed home. But the prospect that tomorrow they'll be wealthier than today, that works. It works every time and it transcends partisan politics. Because at the end of the day, we are a, we are a, 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 a capitalist democracy. We've all kind of bought into the idea that tomorrow we, we should be wealthier than we are today. And so if we make the economic argument above all else, there may be a chance that people will understand the actual role that NASA has played and not the one that those, um, the dreamers say about it because I, I think NASA should be fully funded because I'm a scientist, and, but I don't require others to feel the same way. But when it comes to money, that's something we can all agree on. Well, you've said it... Uh pretty well. Uh, science literacy is going to be uh, our future, and somehow we need to translate that into overcoming these obstacles. 
and you have laid out uh, the case as good as anyone. Now we just got to keep on keeping on to get the message through. And, and I'll say if you want to do the homework, uh, check out the, the GDP per capita in the 1960s into the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's in the 30 percent across that decade, the 10-year rise in the GDP per capita of the United States. Just watch it drop as the decades unfold, and that's us coasting on it. And if you average the 90s with the 2000s, it's basically flat. And so uh, the future, as goes the future of NASA, so too does the future of this nation. And with that poignant thought, thank you, and the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>